And welcome to, to you. with Melinda. Hi, Renato. How are you? I'm doing great. How about you, Melinda? I am fabulous. And to my viewers, I'm so excited to interview my friend, Renato Akeem. Thank you for being with us this morning. Thank you for uh, having me, Melinda. It's a pleasure and an honor to be with you. You bet. Well, let me tell my, my viewers a little bit about you. You're an author, a philosopher, a connector, a wanderer, a business development executive, and multi-industry consultant, and you are a musician. Would you say that's correct? <laughs> oh, almost. <laughs> almost? Or, I'm not necessarily a philosopher, I'm not necessarily a musician, but I like philosophy and I love music. Well, I've read, I, I, your, I've read your books and I do believe you are a philosopher. I think that you have a philosopher's look at life in, in a very thoughtful way. And I think you do that. Thank you. So to me, you are a philosopher. So um, let's start at the very, very beginning, Renato. Talk to us about being born and raised in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Sao Paulo is a big city. I was uh, born and raised. My parents come from uh, from Lebanese background. They uh, never spoke a word in Arabic. Uh, when their parents came to Brazil from Lebanon, uh, they came under the Ottoman Empire. That's 100 plus years ago. So there, there, there is a background on the Lebanese side, but, uh, you know, Christian side, quite different from uh, from um, other religions in the in the area but uh, you know we were raised as as Brazilians and uh, until I started to travel the world uh, that I that I could appreciate you know what Brazil brings and appreciate what the world brings into the into my psyche if you will so so who do you believe had the greatest impact on your life and the optimistic and beautiful way that you connect with people and with your thoughts? Who had the greatest impact growing up on who you who you are today? You mean uh, figures or yeah, or, or indivi individuals uh, who yeah. in your life, your fa people, members of your family or and, and why they had the impact to to help to shape the person you are today? Definitely mom, mom and dad. My mom is was an artist, you know, she's she's 95 now, she's not painting anymore, but uh, definitely she she played a role in uh, in my appreciation for the arts. And my father uh, in, in in my appreciation for for business, for uh, in exchanging, both had a strong component of um, interacting with people and family and friends so we we capture that in in a big way i have three sisters wonderful beings that we truly get along with uh you know it, it's a great story so definitely it started in in the house in the home and it expanded to teachers for sure uh musicians uh Definitely uh, soccer players in some ways, and then uh, it, it expanded. Uh, you know, when I when I went to, to school and started to learn, you know, who the influencers of uh, philosophy and economics, which is the you know the the field I chose to to to, to study, would do for the wellness of people for the it, you know economics is the science of uh, well-being if you will right so there's a lot uh through this field that we can learn and capture and then understand uh you know the world uh, you know in 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 multiple angles from multiple angles and multiple ways so so renato you you uh you you went to college in california uh, and while you were there, you played your acoustic guitar and you washed dishes at the now defunct Good Earth Restaurant, which we all remember. Uh, talk to us a little bit about about that time. And and was that right after you left your your home country of Brazil that you went to California? Yeah, I, I kind of wrote that extensively in, in my uh, first book. And I, and I 
definitely told the whole the whole story. But you know, in a nutshell, I went to Berkeley, California, uh, to take classes uh, for about a semester, and I met a lot of wonderful people that you know we became become friends for life, and that was in 1980. So uh, I was looking for for a guitar, and I met uh, incredible people that uh, opened doors. Uh, to me, to to mingle and you know visit places, take classes, and interact with uh, people from all over the place. And and you also traveled through Europe, and you lived in a in a in a kibbutz, right? Yes, that was that was part of the experience. Uh, I wanted to expand. You know, that was it, was it was the first time that I left the country was when I was twenty one. So I was really ready to. To rock and roll on on a backpacking uh, fashion, and that's what I did for over a year. I uh, visited uh, many countries, ended up in a kibbutz where I wanted to 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 experience the life collectively. Had great admiration for uh, for that kind of uh, lifestyle, and, and again. Uh, meeting people was was the major uh, goal, Melinda always had the curiosity to uh, learn and um, expand my horizons and nurture relationships. I have friends from 60 years. I have friends from 50 years, 40 years. So this is a, some, a treasure that I, that I truly value. And I, and I think cultivating is, is part of the, part of my DNA, if you will. Well, it's very easy to be friends with you. <clears throat> I mean, you're an easy person to like. So I just want you to know that you're very easy to, you're very easy to like and to love. So what brought you to Vermont? So uh, again, part of the book, uh, it is in the book. So we're gonna, uh, well, I, we're going to get, we're going to get into your book, but these, I just want to know these questions and then we'll talk a little bit about your book. So right, talk about part of the first, first book, right? Part, oh, right. part of my, my first book. So, 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 so in a, go ahead. No, I, I was going to say, so in a nutshell, I become friends with uh, with an American man that uh, was doing was going to the kibbutz for the third time. So the idea, the whole idea, was uh, to do that kind of work that he wanted to do. So when I got to the kibbutz, they said, "Hey, you're going to do this job uh, in a couple of weeks. James is coming from from the U.S. and he's going to do your job." So just a temporary thing. So when when James uh, finally landed. I, you know, we become great friends and James is a guy from, from Pennsylvania that moved to Vermont in 1982. Uh, you know, he went to Brazil a couple of times. I came here a couple of times. He went for the third time. I said, James, I'm going to bring the family and spend Christmas with you. And that was, uh, you know, January, 1999 or well, Christmas, 1998. I ended up not coming from Chris for Christmas, but we came for the couple of weeks uh, that it was it was an interesting situation. I had a, a consulting company in Brazil in uh, ex, you know exports, imports. And that particular two week time frame, uh, Brazil had a major devaluation of the currency. And I just came to James and said, James, this is gonna change. I have a will have to redesign my whole business. Maybe I can redesign it from here. What do you think? He said, why not? And that that's the name of my first book, Why Not? So that is in, in honor to James's uh, uh, statement saying, hey, you know, I'll give you the support. I'll give you the clues to, to you know, for you to restart your life in this neck of the woods. I love Vermont for, you know, for, for the first time, I love the landscape, love the inexistence of billboards on the, on the highways. So those were things that contrasted uh, big time with the experience I had in a big city like Sao Paulo that I wanted to bring to my family and go for that, you know, for them to, to choose, you know, if you, if you can choose, uh, this is one side of things, and Vermont became, you know, basically our home since uh, 1999. 
So let's, so let's talk about your book. Uh, mm -hmm. In 2018, your family home was destroyed by fire and you used that upheaval to frame your memoir. Why not? Migration journeys, melodic strides and quests for meaning. Talk to us about this experience and the epiphany that you had. Um, 10 days after the house uh, burned down, I sat down, I was uh, in a hotel and family was in a hotel in uh, in South Burlington. Mm -hmm. I sat down and I said, I'm gonna write a book and tell this story to my kids. In hours, in four hours, I sat down and I wrote the, the, the entire outlining of the book. And it came very organically, very spontaneously. From that time on, it took me about 20 months to finish up the book. The book worked as, as an exercise of uh, writing, but it worked as a, as a therapeutic uh, tool to help us go through the period of, uh, you know, uh, we were experiencing after the, the burning of the house, the, the dilemma of reconstructing or selling the house. Uh, so it turned out that we did rebuild the house and we rebuilt a beautiful house in, in Essex Junction. Uh, it was, it was a, uh, you know, I, I like to say that I embraced the experience more than, than I, I thought I would because you know, writing, you know, just help me order my mind around the experience. Thank you for that. So you state that you were always on a quest for meaning. Can you explain this to us and how close are you to finding that meaning? Sure. Uh, the, the book is a memoir, but not necessarily only a memoir. It's, it's more than that. So what, what I tried to gather, Melinda, was... Uh, I, I had a, a you know quite a good exposure to um, to the, the aspects of uh, learning the meaning of phases of life. How do I put myself in this context? And in writing the book, I incorporated a couple of authors in in this book that help me situate myself in, in different phases. So they divide, both divide uh, uh, our, our lifetime in, 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 in seven years. Every seven years, something happens to us. A little before seven, a little after seven, but seven is a, is a magic number that uh, uh, help, help uh, you know, situate in, in, you know, around you know, experiences, um, you know, whole, process of, of growth, maturity, and uh, and then, you know, decline. So in, in a nutshell, I'll, I'll just bring that as, a, as an example. So every seven years, from zero to seven, life is considered to be good. From seven to 14, life is considered to be beautiful. 14 to 21, life is truth. 21 to 28, life is sensation. From 28 to 35 and 42, life is organization. And then life mirrors, you know, on the on the opposite side. 42 to 49, life is sensation again. 49 to uh, 56, life is truth again. 56 to 63, life is beautiful again. And 63 onward, life is good again. So considering that you know we used to live up to 70 now we live much longer than that but let, let's say an average is 70 years so so these two authors uh they they put that context in place and then you know what i wanted to do is is communicate in the book my experience and how it matched with that concept and then offer the the reader who to you know look at themselves and say, hey, this is a valid uh, or not a valid philosophy. Viewpoint. Right. philosophy viewpoint. So now talk to us about your most recent book that's just been released. Every Day I Thank You, Tales right. of Appreciation for Hands, Hearts, and Minds. 
And I just sort of wondered why hands is in there, but why is hands in there? Hands is what we do with, is our, our, our action, action ants, right? So, I, you know, it could be hands, it could be our solar plexus, it, it's our action, right? So it's the physical uh, aspect, it's the physical aspect of our humanity. Correct, right. okay. yeah. And then hearts, obviously, and mind. So, you know, there's, there's, there's a unity between these three, uh, uh, these triad, if you will, right? So talk to us about this new book that you're just releasing. Sure. So Melinda, uh, just like the, the first book, this came very organically as well. And I like to think that if I if I write more, you know, on a, a third book or a fourth book, uh, it has to be an organic thing. Why? Because first off, I am not obliged to, to write it. I am uh, I am compelled to write it because I feel there's a value to it. Right. And uh, I was, you know, uh, driving one day, listening to a, a particular song called Every Day I Thank You from a from a, 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 a wonderful musician that I that I truly, truly appreciate. His name is Pat Matheny. Oh, Pat Matheny. Love Pat. Yeah. Yeah. So th this is a song that he wrote in 1980. And intrigued me why he he gave that name to to the title, why he titled the the, the, the song as, as such. So I did do you know quite quite a research, and I found out that one of the musicians musicians Michael Brecker, uh, you know was was going through a hard time uh, during that time, and Pat Metheny wrote that song specifically for for Mike Mike Brecker. Uh, and and so his performance is, you know, you you listen to a, a, a nice tune a thousand times, you always find something new about it, right? And that that's my experience with the music of Pat Matheny. That's my experience with the that particular tune. Every day, I thank you. So again, organically, I sat down and in a couple of hours, I came up with the nine uh, topics of of this book that uh, prompted me to say, okay, every day I thank you, but I want to thank my my fellow human being for valuing a, a few things that I do value. And if he does that, like I think every 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 fellow, fellow person should do, his or her life, their life, uh, you know, will, will improve. So the themes are, are pretty... Uh, you know, I like to think are, are substantial. You know, they have they they carry some some weight, uh, and um, you know, I like to think that uh, you know if uh, if we do our our jobs uh, as as civil civil beings, you know, our lives can can be better. Would you Would you like to read a couple a, a couple of lines from your new book called Every Day I sure. Thank You? Sure, absolutely. I have, uh, you know, kind of separated out one particular one, uh, a particular one here, and it's on page um, page one forty eight. It's called Grace Amazing. So, and here I tell I tell multiple stories, and one particular story of a, of a friend uh, that's um, you know I'm not gonna gonna spoil, but she has a, a, a great uh, attitude to, towards her, her, her own life and towards uh, other people's lives. She's a Burlington uh, dweller. Uh, the reader uh, will find out who she is as she is, as they read the book. But uh, the title of this subchapter is, sub is Grace Amazing. There are many symbols for grace as well as there are multiple meanings. The ocean is one of its largest symbols with shallow with shallow and deep currents permeating its never ending motion. It may be unpredictable, but the motion of the ocean is a wonderful representation of the emotions tied to grace. Also seen as a symbol of stability, it is boundless a place where one can easily be lost and can therefore be seen to represent the unlimited span of our essence and the way we can navigate our journey through life. Quote, 
the polarities of movement and stillness inform my life, unquote. For the last 15 months, since finishing chemotherapy, exercise has been Abby's saber. Quote, the more I move, the closer I am to sane, and, and I am so grateful to get to work mostly on my feet. Breast cancer complicated my relationship with my body even more. I did, every, I did everything right, took such good care of myself, and still I got sick. We were allies. At times, it's been difficult to celebrate my body, unable to touch it, or even look at it. This is changing, and with a lot of grace, as medications and surgeries have made it, uh, made it look a certain way that is largely out of my control. My self-care is on fleek, and, and I love my body for its function and strength. Trauma is stored in the body, and it has taken me a while to get over the shock and fear, as well as the cutting and poking. That's beautiful. It, it is beautiful. It's, it's so beautiful, Renato. So I know that you recently had a very serious medical emergency, mm. a medical event that happened in your life that was very challenging. And I don't know if you want to share it with our viewers, but you did emerge from that with renewed strength and purpose, I believe. It's, it's true, but, but you know, definitely not, nothing can compare to such a serious, uh, you know, uh, undertaking that Abby's going through. But you know, obviously, uh, it had had a you know, quite quite a toe. So I had a had a combination of meningoencephalitis while visiting my mom back in March, which culminated in a fifteen day um, ICU experience, which uh, I had a had a major drop of um, of oxygen that almost took me to, to the other side. Uh, that, that's how, you know, how I refer to it. If it weren't for my wife, Sylvia, you know, I, I probably had, uh, you know, major consequences of uh, memory, cognitive issues, or even, you know, uh, you know, fatal, fatal experience. But she was there. She saved my life. Not on, not, not only once, but probably twice. Um, I ended up, uh, you know, fracturing my shoulder in four pieces. Coming back to Vermont, I had to go to undergo a, a surgery that, that, you know, they, they, you know, the University of Vermont did a did a great job. So, so my experience was, you know, uh, probably a little, uh, little difficult, but. I'm I'm back. I'm strong. I I'm recovering uh, in in a big way. Thank you, Melinda. Yeah, and also our hearts go out to Abby. I hope she's doing okay. Yeah, Abby. Abby is an amazing person. I, I think you 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 meet her. I would love point. to meet her someday. But give yeah. do give her do give us our, give her our very best. You know, throughout your your books and in your life, and just in how much I've gotten to know you as a friend. One of the most, one of the big, big words that you use so often is gratitude. And, and so could you share with us a little bit with our viewers about what that means to you, gratitude? Let me, uh, let me read to you, Melinda, um, a, a topic on, on gratitude that I think will, will definitely encompass. And it's, it, it, you know, in the book, but I, you know, I'll, I'll respond to you by reading this. Gratitude, the sheer theme of this book, is the return to the origin. It calls us to remember where we come from, to recognize the forces that sustain us, and to acknowledge our place within the broader network of life. It becomes a transformative force, guiding us back to our most fundamental connections with ourselves, with each other, and the universe at large. Gratitude closes the loop in the cycle of giving and receiving, creating a continuous flow that strengthens relationships, build commu builds communities, and fosters a sense of belonging and unity. I, I think that's that's a good uh, depiction of, uh, of gratitude in, in, in many ways. So it, it, it closes the loop. It, it's the beginning and it's the end. Uh, you know, again, my, my experience, uh, you know, before finishing the book, I had written 90% of the book when I got sick. 
but uh, you know, it just reinforced uh, the 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 you know the the need for us to cultivate this you know uh, this phenomenon, which is uh, the gratitude in our in our lives, and think uh, you know what it, what it does to us. It's it's a healing tool and very powerful tool for us to go through the you know good times and bad times as well. It's not even go. call them bad times, but you know times that can be challenging. And you do this that with great grace, Renato. So I would like to hear from you regarding the future of our planet and our people. What words of wisdom do you have for many of us who are trying to protect both? We're trying to protect both the planet and our people and our freedoms. Uh, but you're finding it kind of a hard slog, but we're finding it a hard slog. What words of wisdom would you have for, for my viewers? I, I captured that from for, for, from what it is out there, Linda. Not nothing new from from my my side. But you know, I like to look at the indigenous people as as the foundation uh, for you know the the renaissance of, of our of our planet. They they knew it. They knew it really well, you know, what to do. We we perverted and we corrupted that 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 sense in so many ways throughout, you know, the past 500 years. We uh, as 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 humans, uh, unfortunately, we uh, we we did things that uh, are hard to reverse. But if we we touch on on uh, you know the the basics of how to care for the planet we need to go back and 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 and, and do the research as to how they saw uh the planet and and you know you know how to avoid um, destruction of it in in one of the chapters about the environment i bring up uh, quite a few characters and one of them is uh leon leon senando uh, from uh, from New York, you know, and he's he used to be uh, the, the 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 representative of uh, one of one of the local uh, indigenous people, and he, he had a clear vision. You know, if we if we destroy our environment, we're going to destroy the planet. We're going to same we're thing. Gonna, the planet's going to survive. It's the species that's going to be destroyed. Right. Right. And, and you know, and then there's got to be a reason why we're here because, uh, you know, we we are you know ultimately the 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 conduits for its revival or for its uh, destruction, right? So we we need to learn that. And and in the other the other uh, uh, indigenous uh, examples, and there's quite a few. In this particular chapter, one is uh, is uh, in Brazil. His name is Kaká Wera, whom I met, uh, you know, a few months ago. Incredible man! He wrote twelve books. He is uh, he's doing a, a, an incredibly smart work in order to first off, you know, bring its you know bring the the, the indigenous people in Brazil. And show them as as not indigenous only, but and not you know not romantically, as many people see indigenous people, but allowing them and, and you know in rescuing their 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 wisdom on the environment and how how to uh, you know help the the natural environment so so that. This well, can be projected. Well, speaking about Brazil, because we're coming sort of to the end of our show, but you must have lived through those times uh, in Brazil when the regime that lasted from 1964 to 1985, 20 years, where people's civil liberties were suppressed and there was censorship of the media. And we're approaching this time in our in American history where there's a lot of concern out there that this that the authoritarian leaders and dictatorships could actually happen here. Talk to us a little bit about that. Were you alive during that period in Brazil? Yes, absolutely, that? I was. So, so you must be concerned seeing what's going on in this country. You you must be right. Absolutely, I'm 1964. I was six years old. 
when when that happened and you know what 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 appeared to be a, a, a healing process for the, the the threat of communism in Brazil at the time has become you know became at the time uh, uh, an authoritarian uh, regime that governed the country for 21 years yeah. and 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 it it just uh, it took the country to directions that uh, you know uh, delayed the progress of of people in 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 such a big way, um, uh, you know. I I think you know what we're going through right now, Belinda, Melinda, is probably much more dangerous than what 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 happened in Brazil at the time, because at that time, you know, you, you didn't have one figure. You have multiple figures, uh, uh, you know, thinking that the best form of government, uh, you know, would be the military uh, military joint that would uh, save the country, you know, if you will. Right now, what we have is, you know, we went back to, to Napoleon times, right? This is, uh, you know, a, a lot more dangerous, a lot more uh, threatening to, to people's liberties. Well, thank you and, for that. We're getting close to... Um... To this period of time in American history that mm -hmm. I think we're all really on pins and needles right now. Well, we're coming to the end of our show, Renata. To my viewers, Renata Joachim has written two incredible books. One is Why Not? Migration Journeys, Melodic Strides, and Quest for Meaning. And the other one, which is just being released, I think this, this month, is Every Day I Thank You. Tales of Appreciation for Hands, Hearts, and Minds. And both these books can be found in your local bookstores or online if you go there, but they are in at all your local bookstores. So Renato, I could talk to you forever, um, but unfortunately our time is up. And I just want to tell you what a joy it was to have you on my show. And for me, and I think anybody who meets you, you're an inspiration and you're a deeply kind and loving person and the light that you bring to your life and to others' light, others' lives are is bright, warm, and illuminating. And I just think you're an absolutely beautiful soul. And I thank you for taking the time to write these two incredible books that everyone should read. Um, and I want to thank you for being on my show. I hope you come on again after you write your next book. <laughs> thank you so much, Melinda. It's it's been a pleasure. I you know how 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 I think about the work you do and uh, everything you said goes right back to you. Well, thank you, my friend, and to my viewers. I really appreciate uh, your time today. And I just want to remind you that on November 5th, you all need to get to the polls. So please, um, please do so. And if you need a ride, you know, give, give a friend a call. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you, Renato. And I'll see you all soon. Bye-bye.